we are going to start a series of the anatomy of the pelvis and the perineum and this is the first part so we'll start by the bony pelvis by the hip bone we'll summarize the important features which you have to know while studying the pelvis what you can see here is the x-ray on the right side for a child on the left side this is the hip bone adult hip bone the hip bone is formed of three parts the ilium the pubis and the ischium and those three parts will meet to form the stabular fossa here the share is one-fifth for the pubis two-fifths to the ilium and two-fifths for the ischium they meet also at the side of the pubic arch between the ischial ramus and the inferior pubic ramus that line fusion at the stabulum the meeting point will unite at the age of 14 to 16 14 in females mainly and 16 in the male the site of the pubic arch will unite at the age of 7 years around 7 years of age that is the meeting bonds and the age of union of these three bonds together as an adult hip bone here it has two surfaces outer and inner surface the inner surface as we will see will be divided into two parts iliac fossa and sacro-pelvic surface let's start by the outer surface which we can see here that is the gluteal surface of the ilium and that is the upper border which you call it the iliac crest that is the anterior border of the ilium and the posterior border of the ilium here we'll see the medial border when we come to the inner surface along the anterior border this is the anterior superior iliac spine and this is the anterior inferior iliac spine here is the posterior superior and the posterior inferior iliac spine will be shown again more clear on the inner surface we can see here the anterior the middle and the posterior gluteal lines or the anterior the posterior and the inferior it can be either ways and this is the area of origin of the gluteal muscles the minimus the medius and the maximus here you can see the greater cytic notch and the lesser cytic notch with the ischial spine in between you can see the body of the ischial and the ischial ramus these are the two parts of the uh, ischium you can see the anterior border the posterior border and the lateral border of the body of the ischium you can see the ischial tuberosity here the very large tuberosity here you can see the femoral surface and the gluteal surface of the ischium and we'll see the pelvic surface from the other side that is the obturator form in here the stabulum you can see the fossa the notch and the urinate surface the articular surface here
looking to the medial surface you can see the medial border here of the inner surface which is formed of the articular border and the arcuate line dividing this surface into iliac fossa and sacro pelvic surface sacro pelvic surface part for articulation with the sacrum and part which will share in the formation of the walls of the lesser pelvis or the true pelvis any part on this surface here is called pelvic so you got the pelvic surface of the pubis the pelvic surface of the ilium the pelvic surface of the ischium here that is the sacral part which articulate with the sacrum you can see it is divided into two main parts an auricular surface which articulates with the sacrum to form the sacroiliac joint the synovial part of it then an iliac tuberosity elevation here which is attached to the sacrum by an interosseous ligament and it is supposed to be a fibrous joint here there will be an anterior sacroiliac ligament and posterior sacroiliac ligament and interosseous ligament here that is the sacral part that is the iliac fossa here which give origin to the iliacus muscle that is the anterior superior leg spine the anterior inferior leg spine that is the posterior superior iliac spine the posterior inferior iliac spine that what we call it the arcuate line that is the iliobictinian eminence or iliopubic eminence the fusion is very clear here between the pubis and the ilium then this is the bactinian line which will be continued with the pubic crest here we'll show it on the other side that is the greater static notch again the ischial spine the lesser static notch the obturator foramen on the right side that's again the inner surface showing the superior pubic the body of the pubis and the inferior pubic ramus. here you can see the surfaces and borders of the sububic ramus in a very clear way that is the bictinia line the continuation of the arcuate line and the iliobictinian eminence here that is the obturator crest and that is the inferior border it has three surfaces a bictinial surface an obturator surface and the outer is the femoral surface that is the borders and surfaces of the superior pubic cremus the body of the pubis have a medial surface or symphysial surface an upper border which we call it the pubic crest lateral to it this is the pubic tubercle it has a femoral surface on the outer side and in the inner side in the other side will be the pelvic surface For the ischium, we can see the body, 
and the ramus only. On this side, you can see also the Bictinia line, which we have seen, and the inferior border of the body of the pubis. That should be the obturator crest, and this should be the Bictinial surface. That is a rapid summary for the surfaces and borders of the hip bone, which are the basic just to follow when we are describing the anatomy of the pelvis and the perineum. That is the sacrum, which completes the bony pelvis posteriorly with the articulation of the two hip bones on each side. When you look to the sacrum from the front, we can identify the promontory, the ala, the upper part which we call it the base here for articulation with the fifth lumbar vertebrae, the two articular tubercles which articulate again with the fifth lumbar, this is secondary cartilaginous joint, these two joints are synovial joints, then a median part and two lateral masses, sometimes they call it the wings, but these are the lateral mass and this is the median mass here. That is the transverse lines as a result of the fusion of the five pieces of sacrum which will result in some features which we can see now. The first feature is that the intervertebral foramen now have an anterior sacral foramen, usually in the vertebral column, it is in the lateral side. But because of the fusion here, you have an anterior sacral foramen and posterior sacral foramen. The other thing is the fusion, as we said, forming the median and the two lateral masses. Below it articulates with the coccyx forming the sacrococcygeal joint, again a cartilaginous, secondary cartilaginous joint. In male, the sacrum is concave from end to end, but in the female, it is straight in the upper three pieces and become concave from the lower two pieces only. So it is concave from end to end in the male and straight in the upper three pieces concave in the lower part of the sacrum to give space for the pelvis. Looking from the back, this is what we call the sacral hiatus and the upper part here will be the beginning of the sacral canal and this is the lower part of the sacral canal having two tubercles on each side of the hiatus here. This hiatus is high and this is not normal. Usually the normal it ends at the last piece of sacrum but it can extend up to any level, a sort of spina bifida but it's not, does not have a bad effects here. The union of the spines in the middle line, the fusion, will create what to call it the median sacral crest. The fusion of the articular facets will form the medial sacral crest, while fusion of the transverse processes will form the lateral sacral crest. These are the posterior sacral foramen over here. Usually, the main part which we have to, to take care of or to remember all the time is the contents of that sacral canal. 
in a summary from outside to inside. We have the posterior lumbar ligament on the back of the vertebrae here. This is the most outside structure. Then a space which you call it the epidural space. When it goes up this epidural space, it can be called in the vertebral canal the extradural space. It is continuous with each other. Here we can call it epidural because the dura does not go down. In that epidural space or extradural space in the whole vertebral canal, it contains semi-liquid fat which helps in support of the spinal cord. And more important is the internal vertebral plexus of veins, which is a large plexus extends from the sacral hiatus here up to the formula magnum through the vertebral canal. It occupies this whole vertebral canal. Its main feature that it is valveless, it has no valves. The other main feature or important feature that along the course of that plexus in the spinal canal, it communicates with the plexus of veins in the pelvis, in the abdomen, in the thorax, in the neck. It's free communication but mainly with the pelvis, because the pelvis, as we will know, has a specific feature of the venous plexuses around each organ in the pelvis. Through this communication between outside and inside the canal, infection and cancer cells can be freely communicated to the rest of the body along the vertebral column. The main organ which can do that is the prostate in the male, but other organs, the bladder, the uterus, any organ can do the same. Within the sacral epidural space here will be the lower lumbar and coccygeal nerves, the roots, the lateral sacral vessels, branches, and the median sacral vessels, branches, crossing from the anterior foramina to the posterior foramina, and some branches will enter to supply the structures within the epidural space. Next to that will be the dura mater, which will end at the level of the second sacrum, these. Second to the dura, deep to it, will be the subdural space, which is a potential space. Any contents in the subdural space, blood, fluid, bus, whatever, is a pathogenic phenomena. Deep to the subdural will be the arachnoid, again to the level of the second sacrum. Deep to it will be the subarachnoid space containing the cerebrospinal fluid and the blood vessel supplying the spinal nerves and up the spinal cord with the roots of the upper lumbar nerves coming out from the coda equina to get exit from the anterior and the posterior sacral foramina. Next will be the phylum terminal, the extension of the biomatter which will end up to the back of the coccyx. That is the contents of the sacral canal. That is a good specimen, cadaveric specimen, showing the ligaments 
of the pelvis the external ligaments or the ligaments attached to the bones this is the sacrospinous ligament between the last piece of sacrum and the ischial spine this is the sacrotuberous ligament extending from the median lip of the ischial tuberosity to the back of sacrum and the coccyx and the posterior superior and inferior iliac, iliac spines this is the inguinal ligament and this is the pectineal ligament over the pectineal line here and this is the lacunar ligament the lateral extension from the medial end of the inguinal ligament over the pectineal line that is the lacunar ligament that is the obturator for membrane here and this should be the obturator canal which will transmit the obturator nerve and vessels clearly this is the greater sciatic foramen and this is the lesser sciatic foramen that's a good specimen or cadaveric one now to the planes of the pelvis which we can see here that is the line of inlet of the pelvis and that is the line of outlet of the pelvis you can see between the horizontal I mean the vertical plane and the inlet there is a an angle, acute angle here. Another angle between the horizontal plane and the inlet, which is almost 57, 57 degrees here. Another angle between the outlet and the horizontal plane, which is almost 15 degrees. We know that the pelvis is tilted, is oblique during the erect position and the points to judge this is to put the anterior superior leg spine and the pubic tubercle at a vertical plane it will show you the obliquity of the pelvis in that position which we will see now in the next figure the pubic arch is horizontal is not vertical as it appears in some of the diagrams and this will depend on the orientation of many structures in the pelvis that is the plane of the inlet here the axis of the cavity I mean that is the axis of the cavity the plane of the inlet is this one the arrow is moved a bit so this is the axis of the cavity of the pelvis these are the planes of the pelvis from the promontory to the upper border of the symphysis pubis that is the plane of the inlet from the lower border of the symphysis to the tip of coccyx that is the plane of the outlet and this is the axis of the cavity itself these are the diameters of the pelvis which are important in assessing the size of the pelvis during pregnancy there is the anteroposterior diameter or the conjugate the transverse diameter and the oblique diameter these are the three diameters which usually are considered for the conjugate diameter either the true or the diagonal the true is the one which usually used in radiography and it is between the upper border of the cell's pubis and the sacral promontory 
while the diagonal is the one used during vaginal examination between the lower border of the symphysis pubis to the promontory. The transverse diameter, which is larger in female, 125 compared to 120, this is the widest transverse diameter between the side walls of the pelvis. And this can be again measured radiologically. The oblique one, again, 110 in male, 131 in female, between the lowest point of the sacroiliac joint and the opposite iliopubic or iliopectinian eminence, which is the midpoint of the opposite obturator foramen, roughly. These are the diameters of the pelvis. Here is a diagram which shows these diameters. That is the transverse, that is the oblique, and that is the anteroposterior one here. Either the true conjugate or the diagonal one. Here in that diagram, you can see the pubic arch is not seen. This is the proper position of the pelvis in an erect, in an erect subject. The pubic arch will be horizontal, as we said. The brineal membrane, which is stretched between the two sides, will be again horizontal, having upper surface, lower surface, anterior and posterior border. The lacunar ligament, which extends at the medial extension from uh, lateral extension from the medial end of the inguinal ligament will be again horizontal, so it can form the floor of the inguinal canal and so on. So orientation of the description of the structures, especially in the perineum and the pelvis, depend on orientation of that position of the pelvis being oblique. There is some differences between the male and the female pelvises. It's almost around 13 differences counted here. But the main difference or this difference is the result of if you have the pelvis, imagine you have stretched laterally to widen the pelvis to accommodate the fetus and you compress it from above downward to make the short the burst canal as short as possible. Out of all of these, these differences will arise because of this stretching and compression. The inlet is heart shaped in male, wider in circular in female. The pubic arch is narrow here. An acute angle is almost obtuse angle because of the stretch. The margins of the pubic arch are inverted, but here are not inverted in the female. The greater static notch will be narrow and deep, will be wide and shallow in the female. Eschal spines will project more in the male than in the female, and they are inverted. In the male, it is inverted. Eschal tuberosity are inverted, but more inverted in the female. The distance between the two tubercles, tubercles will be less in the male than in the female. The stabula will be wider in male because of the size of the bones compared to the female will be narrow. The obturator foramen will be large and oval in the male, but will be small and triangular in the female. There is a major difference, which we call it the preauricular sulcus. If we imagine that auricle, which is the articular surface of the sacral part of the ilium, which articulate with the sacrum, below the transverse part of this auricular surface, there is a lip where is attached the anterior 
sacroiliac ligament with multiple pregnancies in the female that lip will be stretched creating a sulcus below it which we call it the preauricular sulcus in female multiples it can admit the tip of a little finger so it's a very important point to differentiate between the male and the female pelvises. The sacrum, as we described in the male, can go from end to end, long and narrow. In the female, short and wide, but straight in the upper three pieces and concave in the lower part only. Coccyx will be fixed more in the male than in female. As usual, the bones of the female are more heavier. I mean, the, the bones of the male are more heavier than in the female. That is a view for the female pelvis compared to the male pelvis. The inlet rounded in female, oval in male. The same thing, the outlet is rounded in female and oval in female. And Sometimes we describe it as heart-shaped in the male, the romantic heart, not the real heart of the male and the female. That is the female one, and that is the male one here. You can notice some differences here. The broad sacrum here compared to the sacrum on the side. The promontory in relation to the ala, here it is large in relation to the ala. The other difference which we have described about the wideness of the pelvis here, the oval or the heart shaped over here, you can see the, the hip bone difference between that one and that one here. So we have described the differences and these are two samples of the male and female pelvis. Now we are going to describe the muscles of the pelvis. The group of muscles of the pelvis are usually divided into two types or two groups. Muscles which form the wall and muscles which will form the floor. One muscle is sharing both of them. This is the coccygeus muscle. Although it's a small muscle on the side of the lower part of the pelvis, lower part of the side of the pelvis. So those forming the wall, the obturator internus, the bioformis, and the coccygeus. The floor is mainly by the elevator and I, and partially by the coccygeus also. Those muscles have, can be seen in that cadaveric specimen. This is the obturator internus. Here is the elevator and I, the bioformis. And the muscle in between here is the coccygeus muscle, this very small muscle here. And of course, these are the roots of the sacred plexus. The bioformis will take origin from the middle three pieces of sacrum, the ventral aspect, come out through the greater static foramen to be inserted into the tip of the greater trochanter of the femur. Those short muscles, including the bioformis and the obturator internus, will be lateral rotators of the thigh. The bioformis will take its nerve supply from the roots of the sacral plexus, as has been mentioned, the first and the second. The obturator internus will take its origin from the sides of the inner surface of the obturator foramen, the pelvic surface of the three bones, and the obturator membrane. 
come out through the lesser sciatic foramen to be inserted into the medial surface of the greater trochanter of the femur outside the trochanteric fossa on the medial side. It will be also supplied by a nerve which is the nerve to obturator internus from the lumbar last lumbar the fifth and the sacral first and second the coccygeus is a small muscle as we said will take origin from the pelvic surface of the ischial spine to be attached to the last piece of sacrum and the coccyx with the levator and eye and the bifurmid they close the posterior part of the pelvic inlet and as we said it will share in part of the floor of the pelvis supplied by the fourth and fifth sacral nerves these are the three muscles the obturator internus the bioformis and the coccygeus while the levator ni will be described in some details but over here we can see its origin from the pelvic surface of the body of the pubis from the pelvic surface of the ischial spine over here and condensation of the fascia of the obturator internus what we call it the white arc and this is the origin of the obturator internus as we can see it it will go downwards backwards and medially the fibers to meet in the middle line of the pelvis forming a medial raphe which is more clear at the anocoxial raphe during its direction toward the insertion three groups of fibers will take a special direction which will be seen in the next slide that's how it looks like the fibers of the levator and eye the anterior fibers which arise from the body of the pubis will gain insertion into the perineal body at the posterior border of the perineal membrane surrounding either the prostate or the vagina and forming the muscle which you call it the elevator prostate or sphincter vagina these are sexual muscles it can perform a sphincter to the vagina or raise the prostate during the movements the second part both fibers from the pubis and the arc the white arc will go downwards backwards on both sides and medially to meet each other behind the anorectal junction forming a sort of a sling muscular sling around that anorectal junction that what we call it the buberectalis the posterior fibers which come from the spine and the fibrous arc which we call it the iliococcygeus muscle will meet both sides behind the rectum to form what we call it the anu coccygeal raphe between the coccyx and the anal canal it lies also behind the upper part of the anal canal the action is to support the pelvic viscera to increase the intra-pelvic and intra-abdominal pressure and helps in all vital mechanisms like defecation, micturition, coughing and so on but it is one of the main muscles during childbirth which support the pelvis and increase the pressure during the process of childbirth that is the levator in eye muscle which is supplied by the four sacral from directly from the sacral plexus and fibers from the inferior rectal nerve in the ischial rectal fossa that is the levator in eye muscle
That's the diagram showing the buborectalis, the U-shaped sling around the anorectal junction. By contraction, it will raise up the anal canal during defecation. It will close that anorectal junction to increase the pressure of during the defecation inside the rectum. So it's a muscle which helps in both raising the intra-pelvic, intra-abdominal and help during the process of defecation. That is the buborectalis muscle, part of the levator. Now we are going to describe the nerve supply of the pelvis. The main plexus is the sacral plexus. As shown here, the roots are the ventral rami of the fourth and the fifth lumbar through the iliolumbar trunk, and the upper four ventral rami of the sacral from the first to the fourth. <clears throat> Usually, is described as having a band. And this band will divide into two terminal branches, mainly the pudendal and the sciatic, namely. And some branches will come from the ventral, which is not colored here, and some from the dorsal, which are colored surface of that band. So fibers from the dorsal of the band those are the muscles, the nerves to the muscles, as we'll see. And from the dorsum, these are the two gluteals. And muscular branches directly to the muscles, together with one branch which arises from both the ventral and dorsal aspects of that band, or of the plexus as a whole. Here is the summary of these branches. The terminal is the sciatic and the pudendal nerve, and you can see the roots here. The root value is very important to know, to remember, to work with it. So the sciatic, which is formed actually of two parts united together with the sheath, and that sheath may be totally absent and the two nerves start as two from the pelvis before they go out to the gluteal region, or a short one where division will occur in the gluteal region or the upper part of the thigh, or a long sheath which can reach down to the bubletal fossa on the back of the lower limb. The tibial nerve which will supply mainly the back of the leg, which is the ventral rami of the force, fifths and the three sacral. The common perineal which supplied mostly the anterior or the front of the leg which has come from the dorsal fourth and fifths sacral first and second. As we have noticed that the tibial supplied the back and the common perineal supplied the front of the leg this is because of the reverse rotation of the lower limb compared with the rotation of the upper limb. The upper limb will rotate laterally, so the thumb is lateral. That's where we consider the front and the back. The ventral is the balm, the anterior aspect, and the back is the dorsum. It is reversed in the lower limb where it rotate medially, the big two is medial, so what is front and the upper is back in the lower limb and vice versa. The pudendal nerve will be coming from the second, third and fourth. From the roots, those are the muscular branches to the piriformis, levator uni, coxygeus, sphincter uni, externus. From the ventral surface, as we said, the two nerves to the two muscles, to the quadratus femoris and to the obturator internus, and this is at their roots, fourth, fifth, sacral one, and fifth, sacral one and two. From the dorsum, 
the two gluteals, superior and inferior gluteal, and the perforated cutaneous nerves. And the roots are here for the superior is the dorsum of the fifth lumbar and first sacral, while the inferior gluteal from the fifth lumbar and sacral first second, the perforating second and third sacral. From both ventral and dorsal, this is the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh, which is coming from the, verse, the ventral uh, second and third sacral, and the dorsal of the first and second sacral. That is a summary of the branches of the sacral plexus, and again, the root value is very important to remember. Lastly, we come to the blood supply of the pelvis. We'll start by the arterial supply. And there's four arteries which can reach or will reach the female pelvis. The internal iliac, this is the main one and the largest one. The median sacral, the superior rectal, and the ovarian artery in female. The anterior iliac, as I said, is the main artery in the pelvis. The median sacral is a branch from the abdominal aorta, from the back of the aorta at the site of its bifurcation into two common iliacs. It will descend in the middle line in front of the fifth lumbar, front of the sacrum, to end at the tip of coccyx as the glomus coccygeum, a fibromuscular body. Its branches will be mainly the first pair of lumbar arteries, branches to the anterior sacral foramina of the sacrum to reach the back, and branches to the rectum and the anal canal. The superior rectal is the continuation of the inferior mesenteric artery, and this artery starts at the brim of the pelvis to descend on the side of the rectum and then divide into two branches on each side of its back. And this artery is responsible for the supply of the mucosa of the rectum and the upper part of the inner canal, being the artery of the hind gut, and the hind gut is the endodermal part, which will develop the mucous membrane developed from it. And it will end by an smoothing with the middle rectal and the inferior rectal, which are not of the blood supply of the gut, but they supply the muscular coat of the rectum and the anal canal. And this is a site of Borto systemic anastomosis when it comes to their veins. The ovarian artery is a branch of the abdominal aorta at the level of the third lumbar. It will descend in front of the psoas major to reach the suspensory ligament of the ovary, supplying the ovary, uterine tube, and a smoothing with the uterine artery. That is the ovarian artery. It is one of the two branches of the common iliac artery at the level of the sacroiliac joint, divided into external iliac which will continue to become the femoral artery of the lower limb and the anterior iliac, which is a short trunk, which is then downwards and backwards along the anterior border of the greater sciatic notch to reach the ischial spine, where it ends by dividing into posterior division and anterior division. The posterior division will give the ileolumbar the two lateral sacral and the superior gluteal arteries, which all of them are parietal branches. While the anterior division will give two sets of branches, parietal and visceral, the parietal are the inferior gluteal, the interbodendal, and the obturator arteries. These are the three parietal branches. 
The visceral branches are the umbilical artery, that is the artery of the fetal umbilical artery, which will give the superior vesicle and terminate by forming the medial umbilical ligament, which will reach the umbilicus at the end. It will give inferior vesicle in male, which corresponds to the vaginal arteries in the female, the uterine artery in female only, the middle rectal arteries, these are the visceral branches of the internal iliac artery. And they go to the corresponding structures, the superior vesicle to the bladder, inferior vesicle will give some structure which we'll mention later. The uterine artery for the uterus, the middle rectal going to the muscular coat of the rectum. The, both the inferior gluteal and the superior gluteal will go to the gluteal region to supply the muscular parts there. Interbodendal artery will be dealt in, in details with the perineum, which is the artery which supplies mainly the genital organs. The obturator will go to the lower limb, supplying part of the lower limb, and these are the branches of the internal iliac. That is the summary, where the, from the posterior division, as we said, the iliolumbar, the lateral sacral, the superior gluteal. From the anterior division, the obturator, the interbodendal, and the inferior gluteal. The visceral branches are the umbilical, which will give the superior vesicle, and then terminate as a fibrous band up to the umbilicus, forming the medial umbilical ligament on each side of the middle line. Then the middle rectal the artery to the rectum, which supply the muscular coat, as we said. The inferior vesicle in the male, which correspond to the vaginal artery in the female. In the male, it will supply the ureter, the trigon of the bladder, the seminal vesicle, the ejaculate reduct, and the vas difference. Those five structures are derivatives of the mesonephric duct in the male. In the female, it will supply the vagina, the uterus, and the ureter. Then lastly, the very important artery in the female pelvis, the uterine artery in the female. And this, we have to know the details of that artery. That is the uterine artery here in a good diagram <coughs> showing the close relation to the ureter. It arises from the interiliac lateral to the ureter. Then it will cross the ureter and tear to it. But the main important point, as you can see in that diagram here, it lies anterior to the ureter for almost one inch, two and a half centimeters, very close to the upper surface of or the front of the ureter. And that's where accidental ligation of the ureter can occur during hysterectomy to both the artery and the ureter. Then it will cross the medial side to gain the medial side of the ureter, of the ureter, then ascend along the side of the uterus within the broad ligament and it will supply the uterus at that side, then at the junction between the uterine tube and the uterus it will turn laterally along the uterine tube to end by anastomosing with the ovarian artery. That is a very important relation of uterine artery 
with the orator. That's a good cadaveric specimen showing most of the branches of the internal iliac artery. That is the external iliac artery and that is the internal iliac artery. These are two large lymph nodes along the site of the internal iliac and the external iliac, one of the groups of the lymph nodes of the pelvis. Even you can see a branch coming from the external iliac to supply these lymph nodes here. The branches of the internal iliac, this is one of the most common arteries in the body which have a lot of variations to the extent that you cannot find one artery like the other in different bodies. So it is very common variations occur in the branching of this artery. What you can see here, that is the median, medial umbilical ligament, the fibrosed umbilical artery, the fetal umbilical artery, which fibrosed after birth, giving the superior vesicle here. This is the bundle of the obturator nerve, vein, and artery coming out from the obturator canal over here. That is the vaginal artery which may be one or two branches here. That is the uterine artery in relation with the ureter here, lying in front of it. This is the mid-rectal artery. That is the inferior gluteal. And this is the superior gluteal artery. These are the lateral sacral arteries. That's a good specimen here. A cadaveric one. When it comes to the veins of the pelvis, there is a special characteristic phenomena here in the pelvis, where all the organs within the pelvis, the veins start by plexuses. So we have what we can see in the diagram here, the vesical one, the rectal one, the one which drain the testis, follow the same thing in the bambiform plexus of veins. These plexus, which we are going to describe now, their tributaries will end up in the internal iliac artery, internal iliac vein, mainly, then to the common iliac to the inferior vena cava. The other vein which drains the rectum and the upper part of the anal canal will be the superior rectal vein, which is the portal vein. The other veins are caval veins or systemic veins. The important point which you are going again to stress is this. this Belexuses have free, free communication with the internal vertebral plexus of veins, which we have said during description of the sacrum. Free communication between all these plexuses and the internal vertebral plexus of veins, which traverse the whole spinal canal up to the foramen magnum, allowing the dissemination of infection and cancer cells through that route. That's what we are going to summarize here, that the various pelvic organs form the venous plexus, that's the character here. The veins drains, draining those organs will end in the interiliac, except the gonadal, which is the ovarian here, which will go directly to the inferior vena cava. Those from the uterine, vaginal, vesical, prostatic, and rectal plexuses, together with the pudendal veins, as we said, are tributaries of the interiliac vein. The lateral sacral, the interiliac, communicates with the vertebral venous plexuses. Again, the upper or those uterine, vaginal, vesical, especially the prostatic, the rectal, 
will communicate with the same. It is said that sudden increase of the intramural pressure when coughing may drive blood backward to the internal vertebral plexus, but even without coughing, that communication is there. The emboli from disease of the pelvic can find their way there in the internal plexus. The primary tubers of the pelvic vessel can metastasize through it. In portal hypertension, there's a different aspect where the anastomosis between the superior rectal vein and the middle and the inferior rectal veins will develop into hemorrhoids or piles. So the pelvic venous plexus, which we have described, include the rectal, the vesicle, the prostatic, the ovarian, which we call it the beniform plexus even in female, the vaginal, and the uterine plexus. That is the number of plexuses which we find in the pelvis. And this topic is a very wide topic about description of the venous plexuses of the pelvis.